S-261, introduced by Senator Sears Baruch of White. Yeah. We hopefully it'll be referred to the Committee on Judiciary and they haven't wasted our time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we're going to walk us through the bill and then uh, we're going to hear testimony. I'm going to leave at 11, but I have heard the testimony um, earlier from Justice Oversight. Susan Lawrence is here from California, I believe. Yeah. Uh, welcome to the warm weather in Vermont. We're having a warmer than normal January. All right, good morning, committee. Nice to be back. Thank you. Um, I'm here to walk you through S261, which is the Life Without Parole Bill. Um, there are two uh, suggestions I'm going to make um, for amendments to this bill for the committee to consider, and I'll talk about those as I go through the bill. The first one I'm going to talk about right away. So section one, this is the penalty section for first and second degree murder, um, 2303 of Title 13. So the changes here in subsection A would change the penalty for first degree murder um, from a minimum of 35 years to a maximum of life without parole to a minimum of 35 years and a maximum of life of a life sentence. And similarly, in um, subdivision two, it changes the penalty for second degree murder from 20 years to life without parole to 20 years to a maximum of a life sentence. Um, so you'll see those changes. Um, on the bottom of page one and the top of page two. And this is all perfect. Yes. Um, you can see that on line six on page two. So um, one of the changes that I'm going to float, um, and you may want to hear testimony from some other witnesses from the um, Senator General's office and the state's attorneys and the Attor attorney general, is to strike um, subsections B through G. And if you turn to page two, you'll see a subsection B and C. Um, this language is the former 2303. Uh, this was like the former penalty section for first and second degree murder. Um, and it was declared unconstitutional um, by the U.S. Supreme Court, in, or by the Vermont Supreme Court in Provo in 2005. And the legislature amended it the very next year. So this language that appears here is not unconstitutional, but it was changed. Um, in response to that provost case. It was amended by Act 119 in 2006, and it applies to murders that were committed prior to the effective date of that act, um, which was May 1st of 2006. So these sections of law, B, C, and on, you can't see all of them, they're not all included here, only apply um, to murders that were committed in um, a particular period of time. So I, um, and floating the idea of striking that section because if you read them, this is um, the language is pretty complex. It talks about how the jury has to find um, evidence of aggravating or mitigating factors, um, and then the court can determine sentencing based on those factors um, that the jury finds beyond a reasonable doubt. But again, because the language only applies to to murders that happened prior to 2006. Um, I am floating the idea of striking that section and simplifying the statute so it would only be subsection A. So if I understand, if this is prospective anyway, doesn't that move this? In other words, we're not changing anybody's uh, life without imprisonment status prior. prior. Um, for purposes of applying that statute, yes, but I'd like there's I'd like to go through the rest of the bill because okay. there is an opportunity. Yeah, please, um, just, yeah, because I'm confused now. Okay, I'm okay. sorry. Sorry. Me too. Okay, so let's move on to section two. Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> we'll we'll get there. So this is the consecutive sentences statute in Title 13. This sets forth how consecutive and concurrent sentences are imposed when an offender is convicted of multiple offenses. Um, for which an incarcerative sentence is imposed. So the court makes that determination of whether or not to impose those sentences consecutively, um, back to back, or concurrently, meaning they run at the same time. At the time of sentencing, the court makes that determination. So on page three, you just see some limiting language is added to those first two subsections of the statute. 
referring to a new subsection D. Page four, none of this language has changed. I can talk to you about what, what it means. Um, it talks about how terms run concurrently and how they run consecutively. Um, if you look at um, lines six through 12, when terms run concurrently, the shorter minimum terms merge and are satisfied by the offender serving the longest minimum. And then the shorter maximum terms merge, and again, they're satisfied by the offender serving the longest maximum. So that's when they run at the same time. Um, when they run consecutively, the minimum terms are added to arrive at an aggregate minimum. And that is the, the aggregate minimum is what the, serves as the minimum sentence and then the maximum terms are added to arrive at an aggregate maximum that's equal to the sum of all those maximum terms added up. Okay. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you turn to page five, there's the new language in subsection D. So that provides that. This, this is a policy position, <coughs> choice that the committee can make. Um, the problem that we try to address here, and Brittany and I talked about it, is what happens when there are multiple offenses and they want to run a consecutive on a person and that would so let's say you were 50 years old and you've got two sentences of 20 years to life well if you run them consecutively you've now got 40 years and you're so you're 90 before you're even eligible to consider parole so that would nullify the life without parole in a sense so the idea here was to say, okay, if you're over 25, you could have a consecutive sentence. If you're under 25, you wouldn't. And the I thinking see. there is all the inf information we had about those under 25. If you remember back, we took, we made an attempt to separate them in our prisons, and we tried to look at Emerging adults differently from other adult offenders. So that was the Paul. I just flipped the coin, and that's what we put in. The committee is welcome to hear a testimony on whether that should stay or not, or what we should do. And the second policy choice was to not make it retroactive. And part of the reason for that was that you have a number of cases <laughs> where somebody may have pled guilty in order to avoid being charged federally and facing the death penalty. Or who knows what the plea bargains were and what things happened. So rather than going back and trying to do it retroactively, I believe there are, at the time that we talked about this the first time, I think there were 19 people in Vermont um, who are incarcerated with life without parole. I think it's actually fewer now. So it, it just seems simpler to introduce the bill that way. Um, I did talk with the Attorney General about it, and he felt much more comfortable with it without having it be retroactive. He'll be testifying, somebody from the Attorney General's office will testify next week, but I, <clears throat> I think there's a lot of concern about anything you try to do retroactive, and then you've got victims who, you know, went for whatever reason, I think it just, so. Anyway, those were two <coughs> policy choices that and I talked about when drafting this original. Although I, I do find myself thinking about somebody who's been in prison for however many years, let's say 30 years. Yeah, I'm happy to listen to testimony on both sides of yeah. those issues, but for the purposes of introducing the bill, those were two areas where we thought there may be, oh, there he is, the guy who caused all this trouble. <laughs> Welcome back, Skyler. Thank you very much. <laughs> Welcome to see you. Good to see you back. Can, can I throw out yep. another? Um, and I don't know that this is even possible, and I'm not sure that I completely understand it. But I would like to know what constitute first degree and second degree and, and, ask, and, and look at the question of minimum sentences for those. Because I'm... I mean, I, I don't know if a minimum sentence of 20 years is pretty 
hefty, and I'm not. No, maybe minimum or maximum. No, minimum. So I, that's why I need to understand that what first degree and second degree mean. Okay. In terms of why we would impose a minimum sentence on those, and I, yeah. if there are some that might warrant that, well, but I don't know that they all do. Can we so have that discussion after? Because that would be a much different discussion. Uh, if we were to change the minimum expenses would be a much different discussion then. from thirty five here. Yeah. yeah. Well I I realize that, but as long as we've got this bill, I just circled the minimum. Okay. <laughs> I okay. hadn't anticipated we'd be discussing this. <laughs> I'm happy to get you the statute and talk to you. Thank yeah, you. We, we probably should understand what the yeah. elements are of both crimes. Yeah. I'm glad to talk about that now. Or <coughs> no, no, I think we point. should. Okay. Yeah. If there's any time afterwards, and you can, while the testimony is going on, you can, you can get copies of the statute. That right, I just raised that as for those two yeah. crimes. Thank you. Absolutely. I might have to, if you'd like to know um, the difference between first and second degree murder, it's easy to, I can print out the statute, you can take a look at it. It yeah. might be helpful if I put together some information yeah. about the elements if you want yeah, to. We're to gonna take yeah, this up again next week. we're going to take this up again yeah. next week and get testimony from state's attorneys, yeah. defense bar, the whole, you know, the whole usual suspect. So um, I think we, we can certainly look at this next week. Yeah, I didn't mean to have the discussion now. I just okay. raised it as a okay. something. Well, we can, if you can come up with the elements and all that, some examples of when it's first and when it's second. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Okay, so, yep, yeah, so Senator Sears did a good job um, explaining what that language in subsection B means at the top of page five, provides that people 25 or younger, um, if they are, if multiple incarcerated sentences are imposed on those people, the court can only impose those sentences to run concurrently. Mm -hmm. Section three is the um, life without parole prohibited for people who are 18 or younger. Um, the legislature amended or added the statute in 2015 that prohibited life without parole for minors. Mm -hmm. And this change just makes it prohibited across the board. Mm -hmm. That's relatively straightforward. Um, section 4, another pretty straightforward change. This is the statute setting forth the purposes of the Department of Corrections. If you look on page 6, um, there's, a, there's just a few words struck. I just want to add one thing to you, because I remember reporting that bill on the floor, <laughs> eliminating life without parole for those under 18. And <clears throat> we had two no votes. That was a roll call. Uh, it was an interesting discussion, but I will point out that one of the things that I sold, that most people were sold on, is the fact that no one has ever been charged that was under 18 with life without parole, never been convicted in, in a 200 and whatever years of Vermont history. It never been used on anyone under 18. Well, I found that interesting. We have laws in the books that have never been used. Probably good. <laughs> Probably a lot of them, yeah, right? Anyway. So the change in this section is on page six. Um, it just changes the wording of this uh, sort of policy statute um, to require that the department ensure that anyone, any offender who's sentenced to a period of incarceration be given a plan for returning to the community. It just strikes those words other than the <coughs> And lastly, Section 5, this is, um, we're in Title 28 now, eligibility for parole consideration. Um, the new language is on page 7, and it provides that um, if an inmate was sentenced to life without parole, that inmate should be eligible for parole consideration um, during the 25th year of his or her incarceration. I thought we decided not to make it work your way. So I, I looked at our, our last email, and I think this is how we left it, but we don't have with this, if this is not how you wanted to move forward. Well, that's not consistent that. with the retroactive. So. That's right. If this would make it applicable to people who are currently serving. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't right. want to do that. Okay. I, well, I, we could discuss that, but I was I was under the impression that it wouldn't be in there. So. Okay. I guess I didn't read it carefully enough. So what, what, what I'll do um, when I come back next week is come with a committee amendment that will strike this section, and it will... Um, I would like to um, have the discussion of this going forward. Well, understood. Um, because it, 
in a way it reminds me of uh, the legalization and what do you do with people who were sitting in prison for something that we've been legalized. Um, so here, the only thing that we would be denying the person is a right to make their case to a parole board. We're not freeing them. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't seem like, uh, I, I understand politically it's a bigger lift, but if we could just reserve the discussion for <coughs> at some point, this, this language looks good to me, in other words. So if it leaves this draft, I'm just wondering if we can at a later point have a committee discussion about it. Yeah, and I think we need to hear from the victims of yeah. some of the crimes that, you know, for example, the, what I was hoping to avoid was having a discussion of the Laura Sobel case murder. Yeah. I've already heard from her family who are very worried about having any rediscussion of opening up that, um, whether or not you know, she murdered four people. That, that's where the seems to me that if we want to do a bill, that's what I have. Yep. I have real concerns about doing that, um, knowing what the state went through. That. No, and I can, I can see that, but... And, and some on. of the others are pretty gruesome, so they went under a different... It's, I, under, I hear what you're saying. Because going forward, yeah. we, I mean, God forbid, but if past is present, we will have other gruesome well, events in the future, but life without parole won't be available. I would not have introduced, I would not have sponsored the bill if, if it was retroactive, just to make clear. Okay. I, I'm and just that's asking, fine. You, I'm just asking that we have the you're discussion. You're a co-sponsor and you want to have the discussion, and that's fine. But I personally don't support the Understood. retroactivity. This, so I'll plan to bring um, a new draft the next time this bill is scheduled, and maybe we can just put five minutes for me on at the beginning of the agenda to go through it. You're already on it, actually. I was, okay. I was going to take you off, but... Nope. I, right now, I'm scheduled yeah, no, to be next Thursday. Well, I know, but... Yeah, next what, Thursday. Thursday at 8.30. Yeah. Yeah. Next Thursday at 8.30. So, yes, you'll be first. Great. I was going to take you off, but now I'll put you on to okay, make the now. amendments. And you could offer that amendment also that okay. you wanted to, I'll do that. and maybe try to explain. I will, and I, why don't, I'll get in touch with some of the other people who are testifying, and we can maybe have yeah, would you, consensus. Would you uh, here. send out that redraft sure. ahead of time so they can respond to that yes. redraft rather than this? We'll do it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. It's good to see you again. Nice to see you all. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to step out of this chair because, number one, I wouldn't be able to see the presentation. And number two, I've got to go to another thing at 11. Um, but you could take the witness chair, uh, uh, Susan. And welcome back, Susan Lawrence, um, who is here, uh, I believe, to, be a to the uh, <laughs> Yeah. To the justice, was it justice oversight? Yeah. yeah. Who had the discussion? And um, so I'm going to kind of turn it over to you, Susan. And, uh, get out of your way. Thank you. Uh, I wondered what that was for. It seemed Money pretty fancy me. to me. Yeah. No, actually, I, I just need somebody to start the video. Oh, do you want me to do the video now? Yeah, to start. I just want to say a couple of things. Sure, do you let me know. I don't think then. we saw the video because it didn't. Yeah, no, we didn't last time. No, we didn't see it. Yeah. I thought we did. No, but in any case, it was on the website. But you can see it today. So, um, so I'm really glad to be back here. Um, my name is Susan Lawrence, and I'm the founder and CEO of the Center for Life Without Parole Studies based in California. And um, our work is to end life without parole um, throughout the country and starting with Vermont. Uh, so I'm very happy to be here and to give you this information that I think will, will help you with your legislative efforts. Can I ask a question? Yes. Why did you decide to start with Vermont? Oh, why did I, why did I say well, Yeah, why did Well, um, actually, I was thinking about this even as far back as 2016 because Vermont is, a, is arguably a, one of the most liberal states in the union. There's only 15 people serving life without parole in Vermont. 
Vermont already has um, very progressive criminal justice policies that don't exist in the rest of the country or to a you know, more limited degree. So I felt it, it had the best chance. I really felt it had the best chance to um, um, you know, do this, be the first state in the country to affirmatively end this cruel and inhumane sentence. And then it would have a ripple effect on the rest of the country. So that, that's why. Thank you. Yeah, you Just are. wondered. Yeah. So um, before I start my um, presentation, um, I do have uh, slides that I guess they're going to follow along on the paper slides, or we're going to show um, them up. Here. I could probably try and pull them up here, but I think it'd be very difficult to do slides from this. Yes. Because it's kind of small, but they do have the handout. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I think it might be easier. We well, can see that, but we might want the paper to write up notes on. Oh, yeah, we, we have, have paper in here. Everybody has paper copies. Oh, okay. I think that might be better. This is kind of small to be yeah. reading. But I do want to start with a short video um, that I made, kind of an overview of the subject. And uh, so we can start that now. Yeah. Yeah.
Okay. Um, well, uh, after that overview, I'd like to tell you uh, just a little bit. Um, well, first, I'd like to point out that we do have these slides in the packets that were handed out to you, so you can follow along mm -hmm. if you'd like to. I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself and how I got involved in this work. So um, I'm a physician and a lawyer, and I started out my career as a board-certified internist and medical oncologist. And until um, 1993, I had a private practice of medical oncology in Lancaster, California. Then in 1990, uh, 1993, my husband died of AIDS, and that changed a lot about my life. Um, the year before he died, he said to me, you know, Susan, he said, I'm not dying of AIDS, I'm dying of the delayed effects of child abuse. Um, my husband, Sonny, had come from a really difficult childhood and for many years of his life was an IV drug user and that led to his getting AIDS and, and dying at age 47. So he made that connection and that was, it was such a profound thing to me. I had never really thought about it before. Um, I have treated people with AIDS in my practice. Uh, because the treatment in those days was similar to cancer chemotherapy. But um, I had never thought about it in quite that way before, and it, was, it really changed the way I viewed and not only the AIDS epidemic, but the world. After he died, um, I founded an organization called the Catalyst Foundation, which was at that time dedicated to helping people with AIDS in our community um, and doing HIV prevention. And through that, I started working with uh, teens who were in, detained in prison. And they kind of taught me, the, they opened my eyes to the rest of the problem, which is it wasn't just AIDS that was the outcome of, of unhealed childhood abuse and trauma, but it was uh, drugs and gangs and violence and really most of the uh, most serious social problems that we face. Um, and then in 2004, I started doing a program at the adult prison in our community called Creating a Healing Society, and it was focused on uh, helping the people inside to understand the, the root causes of the crimes that they had committed by looking at their childhoods. So, um, and that's where I started to learn about life without parole because in this particular prison where I was working, the vast majority of people there were serving life without parole. And they had been in there, some of them, for decades. Some, most of them had been convicted when they were between the ages of you know, 18 and 25, 26. You know, that time period where the brain is not fully developed, yet you're, you're held fully accountable for what you do. And now they were 40, 50, some of them 60 years old, and they bore no resemblance to the, the, child, the young person they were when they committed whatever they did. Um, and these were people I would not hesitate to have as my neighbors. I felt safe with them. Um, many of them had a, a extraordinary insight into the driving forces of their crime. And, uh, but they were stuck. No matter what they did, no matter how they could prove their rehabilitation and redemption, they would never again walk free. And the agony and suffering that I observed among them was just uh, astronomical. So I came to see that life without parole is a human rights violation that we conduct in plain sight in our country. Nobody hears about it. Although in the years since 2004, it's become a, t a subject that is much more talked about, and it's probably one of the reasons that I'm, you know, I'm able to be here today. Uh, but um, you know, I feel it is a human rights violation, and it is uh, something that, that I hope that we can all, you know, work toward to uh, eliminate in our sentencing schemes. So, um, so that's a little bit about me and how I got to this point. So I'd like to give you a little bit of a history of life without parole in the United States. So um, the sentence actually dates back to 1851, um, when a man named William Wells, a uh, convicted murderer, was sentenced to die by hanging. But um, President Millard Fillmore commuted his sentence uh, to life without parole. Um, and Wells apparently did not like that, and he appealed um, the, the new sentence, saying that the president didn't have the authority to add a new condition when giving a commutation. It went all the way to the Supreme Court in a case called Ex parte Wells. And the Supreme Court held that, yes, the, the president does have the right to um, 
to uh, add an additional condition. Uh, but one thing that was very uh, interesting about this case was Justice McLean made a very prescient uh, uh, comment, something that you know still today many people um, don't think about. And what he said was, an act has been done entirely inconsistent with decree, as that only suspends the punishment for a fixed period. It is a perversion of the facts to say that Wells has been reprieved by the president. You know, in other words, um, Justice, Justice McLean uh, saw that life without parole is simply another form of the death penalty, death by incarceration. So the president had just changed the form of execution or the manner of execution, but not the fact that it was still an execution. So after Wells, uh, Elwok remained a, a rarity um, for over 100 years, until 1972, when the uh, United States Supreme Court uh, in Furman versus Georgia had uh, temporarily ended people of, of the traditional death penalty in this country. And the states responded, I guess, to public pressure and fear of letting um, these you know, convicted murderers of being let out of prison um, responded by uh, implementing uh, LWAP sentences. Um, so Furman versus George actually brought about unintended co the unintended consequence of an enormous rise in LWAP sentences, which you can see on, on um, the slide here, which is from the Sentencing Project. So in 1992, so in 1972 was Furman versus Georgia, where there was maybe a handful of people serving LWAP at that time. 1992, there were over 12,000 LWAP sentences. 2003, there were over 33,000. Uh, 2008, there was over 41,000. And the latest statistics that we have, also from the Sentencing Project um, 2017 um, paper, Still Life, um, there were over 53,290 people in this country serving life with that goal. And that doesn't even take into account um, people serving um, uh, de facto LWAP, which are sentences which uh, exceed the human lifespan of carried out in full. And there's 44 people who are serving those type of sentences. 44,000. 44, sorry. Thank you. 44,000 <laughs> people serving those type of sentences. So in addition, the, there's racial disparities, as we know, all throughout the criminal justice system. But nowhere except maybe in, in uh, traditional death penalty sentencing are the racial disparities more prominent than in LWAP sentencing. So um, in nine states, African Americans make up two thirds or more of the LWAP sentenced um, prisoner population. Um, and these states are Alabama, Georgia, Illinois, Louisiana, Maryland, Michigan, Mississippi, New Jersey, and South Carolina. Uh, among people serving de facto LWAP, uh, people of color comprise over 65%, um, with African Americans more than half and Latinos nearly 12%. Um, then uh, there is a, it's kind of counterintuitive, I guess, to, to people who may not have thought about this, but advocates who are working to end the traditional death penalty often advocate for policies that expand LWAP and make it even a harsher sentence than you can imagine. So many traditional death penalty abolitionists, and when I say traditional, I make that distinction because I view LWAP as a death sentence as well. So many traditional death penalty abolitionists believe that the only way that they could, uh, they can get people um, to, to get, um, traditional executions to stop is by assuring the public that these people will never be in prison. In other words, that they will be sentenced to life without parole and they will never have an opportunity uh, to go to a parole board. So um, in 2008, I, I um, was instrumental in working with a group of LWAP prisoners at that prison where I was uh, teaching um, and to help them found the, uh, a project called the Other Death Penalty Project. And for 10 years after that, I was their free world liaison. And in, in, that, in so doing, um, I, I attended meetings and, and talked with many death penalty abolitionists, including Mike Farrell. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Mike Farrell. He's a, an actor and an activist. He played in MASH, and he's in California. Yeah, he's a leading. DJ Hunt. Yes, that's right. I could never remember that name, but yes. Um, <laughs> 
and uh, he's a leading death penalty abolitionist in California, and he, uh, he uh, introduced an initiative in 2016 and was active in an initiative in 2012 to end the death penalty, traditional death penalty in California, and really made El Wap a much more harsh sentence. And I met him at a meeting, and I said to him, you know, are you, um, what do you think? I mean, are you aware that El Wap is a death sentence too? And he said, yes, I'm aware of that, but you know, first we have to, it's a stepwise thing, first we have to eliminate lethal injection, then we'll go back and eliminate El Wap. And I said, well, you know, really that strategy isn't gonna work because it's very difficult to go back to the voters because in California it has to be an initiative. Um, for reasons I'll explain in a minute, but um, it's very difficult to go back to the voters and say, oh, we made a mistake, I'm sorry, the sentence that we just told you was a just and fair sentence, now we're saying is inhumane. Mm -hmm. So that's really not going to work. So that's been a stumbling block um, a lot with, in dealing with death penalty abolitionists uh, and LDAP. It's, it's a question, and it's not an issue that we have in, in Vermont because there is no traditional death penalty in Vermont, but in states that have both sentences, it is, a, it is something that has to be contended with. So um, as well, another thing that has contributed to the expansion of LWAP, I believe, is the, of the prison industrial complex, because there are so many companies, um, for-profit companies, that, that profit off long sentence, lot people who are in, in prison for long periods of time, and they have, um, they're very large companies, they have a lot of money, a lot of resources, and they're able to lobby effectively for uh, policies that support their growth and expansion, um, such as the private prison companies, Core Civic and Geo Group. Although, at least in California, for-profit prisons have been banned, I think that goes into effect in 2024, I believe, but they still are active around the country. I believe even here in Vermont, uh, I think I think Core Civic is one of the companies that runs a prison that some of the longer term Vermont prisoners go to. I believe. Just but, uh, a quick correct. question: Is that ban going forward, or is it an elimination of all private prisons? In California, it's supposed to be an elimination of the use of all private prisons. In other words, the state prisons cannot contract with, yeah, yeah. So over the past 14 years, um, the GEO Group gave over $6 million in campaign donations, um, including to um, gubernatorial candidates in states that have the largest prison populations, which Texas and California. Um, over the past 19 years, CoreCivic contributed over $5 million for the same purposes, and they hired, uh, both companies hired uh, tremendous numbers of lobbyists. Geo Group hired 326, and Core Civic hired 462. That's, um, that's a lot of power that they, that they have. In California, although it's less, much less so now because the prison population has been reduced so dramatically, um, in California, uh, the guards union was a very powerful source to keep the prison population large so that, uh, and to keep people in prison for longer periods of time, so that um, their, their benefits and their salaries and you know, all of that would not shrink. But um, it, it, it actually has shrunk over the past, I would say, decade. So I would like to talk a little bit about childhood trauma <coughs> and life without parole, which as I explained earlier is kind of how I, how I got into all of this. And I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, mm -hmm. but um, I'll tell you just a little bit about it um, and then some additional studies that have come out more recently that focus more on the criminal justice system. So the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, you know, actually the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study provided scientific proof of what my husband Sonny said intuitively, mm -hmm. that he was dying of the delayed effects of child abuse. And that's exactly what this study showed. But it's a medical, it was a medical study. It was conducted by the CDC and Kaiser Permanente, uh, published in 1998 um, in the American Journal of Public Health, uh, involved nearly 20,000 participants. And uh, what it found was there was a powerful connection between uh, childhood trauma, and uh, the leading causes of mortality in this country. So um, in the original study um, looked at just certain things that they considered to be trauma, although now we know that there are many more situations that 
uh, are traumatic to a child. But this study looked at recurrent emotional, physical, or sexual abuse, um, recurrent emotional or physical neglect, uh, growing up with um, a family member who is a, a substance user, alcohol or drugs, um, growing up with a family member who is or was incarcerated, family member who is mentally ill, uh, domestic violence situations, which for whatever reason was limited to the mother being treated violently. I mean, it, it's an old study, so um, it didn't take into account other situations. Family, uh, families in which the child has one or no parents, and um, the more subtle forms of trauma that we now know can be so devastating, like attachment trauma, which can be very subtle, um, were not included in the study. I don't think there was a lot of awareness of at that time. But probably a more accurate uh, current description of trauma would be a unique individual experience of an event or ongoing conditions in which the person's uh, inability to cope, the person's ability to cope has been overwhelmed, or a disruption of an important relationship, like a parent-child relationship, without repair. Susan, can I interrupt you for just a sure. second? Sure. I'm due upstairs at 11 o'clock, so I'm going to leave, but I just want to thank you for coming. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Peggy, do we need a computer fix in here? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, yes. I guess we do math. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Over there? Yes. <laughs> so, so that's okay then? Yes. Sorry. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. So, um, so the A study findings um, <clears throat> show that childhood trauma even as they defined it, was extraordinarily common in our society. And that was really a revolutionary um, finding in those days. More than half of the, of the um, Kaiser participants, and these were mostly middle class people who could afford insurance, um, had at least one of these ACE factors that I described. A quarter had two, a sixteenth had four or more, um, and so it, it really showed how commonplace of these these things are, and um, and I, if you look up at on your um, uh, handout, um, another thing that was very important was the higher the A score. In other words, the the more factors a person had, uh, the greater their risk for the leading causes of death in this country. For example, one of the most common things was the higher uh, the higher the A score, the higher the risk for cigarette smoking. Uh, cigarette smoking is um, the cause of heart disease, cancer, stroke, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So that's how they made the connection between childhood trauma, smoking, and one of the leading causes of death in this country. Um, so, but this was a medical study, so it didn't focus on outcomes as far as crime, violence, or life or death in prison, which I believe is you know, one of the clearest examples of the impact of childhood trauma. Uh, in our society. So um, more recently, in 2013, there was a smaller uh, study published in the uh, Kaiser Permanente Journal, which was conducted by the uh, Correctional Service of Canada um, and Intrapsychic, uh, a uh, small nonprofit in San Diego. And this was a small study, only 151 participants. But it concluded that uh, childhood trauma is strongly associated with adult criminality and called for more extensive studies uh, to be done. And probably, um, and this is also included in your handout, the article that this quote comes from. Uh, this is a quote from James Garbarino, who was from the Center for Human Rights of Children at Loyola University in Chicago. This quote really sums it up. It is so, makes it so clear. The best starting hypothesis in dealing with most killers is that they are, quote, untreated, traumatized children inhabiting and controlling the dangerous adolescents and adults that stand accused of murder. I think that really says it all. Um, and to kind of, of um, to, to kind of put a face to that, I would like to share a little a story of someone I know who I've been working with on a commutation application uh, in California. He has Elwha. He's probably in his, um, he's in his late 50s. And um, 
uh, grew up in a, in a home that, that was, well, let me just back up a little bit. As part of the commutation application, I asked him to give me some photographs of his childhood. And he had very few of them. Um, so I have a few photographs of his childhood. I have his booking photo in 1995 when he was convicted of murdering a man in a kind of a drug-fueled, um, horrible situation, shooting a man to death. And, um, and then the, the last picture that I have is of him in prison, graduating from college, shaking the hand of, his, of the warden at the prison. So, um, so what happened was uh, this gentleman grew up in a family where his father was a very violent alcoholic, and he had three older brothers who also who were very abusive toward him. And the photographs include him at one year old in a one of those little um, those bikes, you know, that little kids can can ride. A picture of him at three with this innocent face, and then there's a picture of him. Um, at age five, where he's wearing a cowboy hat and he's like in back in the background, and his three older brothers are like looking down at him, and he wrote on the back of his photograph um, that um, his the cruelty inflicted upon him by his brothers was such that it caused him to withdraw until he got to the point that he vowed he was never again going to be a victim, which he did the following year at age six. And, um, and at that point, they were afraid of him and stopped tormenting him. So what his brothers used to do is they would tie him up, and they would put him in a closet and lock him in the closet for hours at a time. And when he would cry out, and, and he would just be crying, and no one came. When he would go to his dad and say, please help me, his dad, there were two comments that his dad made that were like striking to me. His dad said, um, are you looking for sympathy? That's in the dictionary between shit and syphilis. Um, go look for it there. And then his dad would say, uh, did we hurt your feelings? Um, that's what you get for having any. So there was that one day where he was able to free himself from the closet when he was six years old. And when he burst out of the closet, he said never to himself, he said never again will I be a victim. And you can see from those the early childhood pictures and then the booking photo, you could see the transformation of what what this child had to do to keep himself safe and never be a victim. And his father also encouraged violence, and he would get paid 25 cents if he, gave, if he had a fight at school and gave somebody a bloody nose, 50 cents if he had a fight at school and hurt them more severely. So you could see how he was, you know, by the time he was, you know, eight years old or whatever, he was just set, it was inevitable what was going to happen. It was, it was set in motion. And he got no no help with that at all. So um, so then you know he went to prison and um, started taking rehabilitative programming classes. And he discovered a love for learning and a love for helping people. And uh, this man dropped out of school in the sixth grade because he was already addicted to heroin and alcohol. At by age eight, he dropped out of school. He just graduated from college. He's a brilliant man. So much potential, you know. He he's an excellent writer. Um, if he's able to get a commutation, he wants to become a social worker. Um, he's gotten a, a degree in human services with an emphasis on social work. So this is an example of someone who has been warehoused for decades because of unhealed childhood trauma, who has clearly rehabilitated themselves to the point where they are safe to rejoin society, who has no chance of ever doing so. You know, it's, it's, to me, it's just it's heartbreaking to see. So um, anyway, so um, you know, and and I should say also, in addition to um, to the childhood trauma aspect, there's also, which I know you're all aware of, um, the the fact that people between the ages of 18 and 25 or thereabouts, they're essentially they're not dealing with a full death. Their brain is not fully developed. You know, in the um, the 2012 Miller case, Miller the Supreme Court case, where uh, the Supreme Court talked about the um, immaturity, the inability to extricate themselves from crime-producing situations, the, uh, you know, the recklessness, the you know, inability to plan ahead of young people, and so um, 
you know, now sentencing a, uh, a juvenile to life, a mandatory life without parole for homicide is unconstitutional, which, you know, I know you guys all know that. So why should we end LWOP? You know, it's a death sentence, which is imposed with enormous racial disparities. It's total deprivation of hope, uh, regardless of degree of rehabilitation, uh, is cruel and inhumane, and it is um, the antithesis of restorative justice. And of course, ending LWAP does not mean all people will be released, only that they have the chance to be considered for parole. And I also wanted to point out to you that um, in your packet is a, is a report about the Unger case. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Unger case. So in 2000, it's like a natural experiment that shows that people who have been in prison for decades for serious crimes can safely be released with enormous savings, uh, savings to the government. So in 2012 in Maryland, there was a case, Unger versus Maryland, where um, jury instructions were found to be unconstitutional. Um, and so 100, about 185 people were released. Their sentences were overturned. They were released. These were people convicted of very serious crimes, murder and rape, and hadn't really particularly received a whole lot of rehabilitation. But they were released uh, in 2012. In November 2018, a report was published um, by the, I think it's the Justice Policy Institute. Well, you'll see it on your, on your papers. Um, that showed that during that period of time, only one person was returned to prison. The other people were reintegrated into society with no problem, you know, kind of seamlessly integrated into society. They all got um, reentry services, kind of uh, more enhanced reentry services to assist them in their recovery. But, you know, it, it was kind of a natural experiment that showed that releasing people in those circumstances, even when they haven't been preparing for their release for decades and trying to rehabilitate themselves, it's still um, uh, in the interest of public safety to do so. So, and bottom line, you know, how do we want to treat the children who now reside in adult bodies among us who really, we, our society, failed them? when they were little and they were being abused and they needed help. Our society did not protect them. Our society failed them. And then when they're an adult and they engage in behavior that is really, when we look at it, the natural outcome of what they went through, we lock them up and throw away the key forever. You know, to me, I, I would hope that we would strive for a, um, a society that was uh, more compassionate than that, or more understanding than that, yeah. Can I ask you a question? And sure. We, uh, uh, Senator White and I were touching on this earlier, but you saw the uh, maybe the language that we're looking at, which eliminates life without parole, but leaves 35-year uh, sentences, minimum sentences, mm -hmm. it's standing. Is that something you're concerned with as well? The, the, the length of time? Yes. The minimum? The minimum. Yeah, you know, 35 is, it's, uh, it's pretty long, you know, it's pretty long. Um, on, on the other hand, um, I think it's, it's very important to do what has to be done in order to get the life of that whole um, sentence, you know, mm -hmm. removed. Um, I would be more comfortable with something like 20 years or 25 years or mm -hmm. uh, that's just me, you know, personally. I still feel, um, you know, if someone kills someone, um, it, there is, they do need to, to uh, be held accountable for that and have, you know, pretty significant time in prison. Obviously not forever. Um, and so I think something about the length of time is something that can be debated and, and talked mm -hmm. about. 35 is kind of long, mm -hmm. but, um, but if, if uh, you know, you all feel that that's what is necessary to get this bill passed, I, you know, I certainly understand that. If you think yeah. it would get passed with a lower amount, like 20, 25, it's it's a, a similar political strategy to Mike Farrell's, right? Where he's he's saying let's worry about if we can get uh, mm -hmm. traditional execution done without touching life, without parole. Right. And that, from his point of view, that makes sense. I guess I kind of worry that we would do a similar thing here, where we'd say in order to get rid of life without parole, 
will leave the 35 years in place, mm -hmm. um, the minimum. And, you know, 35 years is a, a lifetime. lifetime. Yeah. So exactly. I, I would be all for having a discussion about, um, you know, 30 years isn't that big a change, but for that person, five years is a, is a massive amount of time. Mm -hmm. So anyway. Yeah. Also, also in California, yeah. we've, we've done, um, they've made other laws that once, once a person is not, um, uh, doesn't have LWAP anymore, let's say they got a commutation, they don't have LWAP anymore, there's other laws that, that uh, soften um, the sentence that they will give them. Like, for example, we have an elderly parole law, which obviously doesn't apply to people with LWAP, but um, if someone has served 25 years, um, and they're 60 years of age, they're eligible for parole. Um, and there's similar things for, um, for people under the age of 26. Mm -hmm. There's juvenile um, offender parole hearings, which... That's a good point. We've, we've been, and you know, Senator Sears has been uh, groundbreaking in a lot of these areas, especially around youthful offenders and, and modernizing and, and making more humane our view of them. But you could say the same thing about inmates who have gone to the end of their lives. And you know, if somebody's 60 or 70, shouldn't we be formalizing an approach that recognizes that, you know, is, is this person who committed this crime when they were 24 at 64 going to still represent any kind of the same risk? Um, well, I think from the Unger case, you can see that yeah. clearly no. Yeah, it, um, exactly, yeah. exactly. So I think what, what I've tried to say by, by, by saying that, I think there is some, there may be some way to, um, once LWAP is off the table, there may be some way to pass other laws that address that. You know? we, there is a bill in here called Compassionate Release, mm -hmm. and um, I, I sponsored that, but, um, and it can be tweaked. It's just the way it is now, I don't think it's the, we want to end up with it, but it would address some of those situations. Mm -hmm. People who have served um, not even a, their whole minimum, but if they're of a certain age and they have, uh, I mean, we have people. I mean, I, I'm doing this on behalf of a constituent is how it came up, whose husband actually shot somebody mm -hmm. um, after being bullied mercilessly, actually went to the place to confront the guy and then shoot himself. And he started, the guy started bullying him again and he just, so, and now he's in, he's not a danger to anybody at all. But so anyway, that's how, the impetus for that, that bill. But it could, it could be expanded to deal with other situations. So it's not just about a terminally ill people? No. Oh, okay. It's called compassionate release. And to be quite honest with you, I'm not even sure what it says. because, But it is a placeholder for us to have the discussion about what we want to do with people who really don't pose any threat anymore. Right. So. That's awesome. So um, why should we end a walk in Vermont? You know, I think we've already talked about that. One thing I didn't mention is about restorative justice being the law of the land in Vermont, mm -hmm. and LWAP is really the antithesis of that. Um, I also wanted to um, to mention that there is a recent report by the Alliance for Safety and Justice. I don't know the exact date, but the, whole, the report actually didn't mention the date. It is on their website, and it's the first crime survivor speak first ever national survey of victims' views on safety and justice. And what they found was that the overwhelming majority of people who have been um, impacted by crime uh, feel that the criminal justice system relies too heavily on incarceration and they strongly prefer investments in prevention and treatment, in other words, rehabilitation, by a two to one margin. So I think we all know that the views of people who have been victimized or impacted by crime are very diverse. Um, but this study shows that the majority of them actually would prefer uh, rehabilitation um, and um, you know and prevention, ways to prevent the crime from happening in, in the first place. 
Do you have that report on your slide here? I wish I did. I just I just looked it up last night. Oh, but um, um, can you tell me? Yes, yeah. it's the um, Alliance for Safety and Justice. So if you just Google that website, okay. and then um, the name of the report is Crime Survivors Speak. Thanks. Yeah, it's really good. I wish I had thought of, about including it earlier. Um, so, and I think earlier on I talked about why should Vermont be the first state to affirmatively end LWOP. Um, and these are some other things that I didn't mention. So um, LWOP for juveniles was already removed from the criminal code in 2015. You know, the criminal justice pol um, policies, and there's only 15 people uh, serving LWOP. And so I think that pretty much that pretty much ends my my presentation. So if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to happy to answer. This might not be a question for you, but where does the opposition to this come from? Well, I think if not um, addressed. Um, I don't want to say appropriately, but it's addressed in a, in a way that is uh, like open-hearted and compassionate. It may come from people who have been victimized by crime and who are still suffering from the impact of that. Um, I think it may come from, from that. Um, it may be coming from, uh, uh, I can't even say that in Vermont because I know um, Sarah George is, is opposed to LWAP mm -hmm. sentences, but it, it may come from prosecutors who feel that they owe it to the families of the of the victims to, um, you know, um, put the perpetrators away forever to provide some kind of healing for them. Uh, it may come from from that, uh, uh, but otherwise, you know, I, those are the only two places where I can think of where it would it would come from. You know, I can think of people who have said, you know, if you don't have life without parole, you should have the death sentence. Because people are afraid. It's fear. It's fear. It's fear. <clears throat> it is. Um, that's, that, you know, that's another reason I feel that we need to continue to humanize people who are in prison, who have, you know, committed some sometimes really horrible yeah. crimes, mm -hmm. but have done the important work on themselves. I guess the other thing I want to say is that, um, Life Without Parole creates victims across the board. It's not just the person who was killed or, or seriously injured or the family members of that person, but it's also the family members of um, the people, the person who was incarcerated. Uh, they have a Life Without Parole sentence too. Um, it, it, it's also that person who most likely under, you know, experienced severe trauma that they're still suffering from. So the whole thing is like a trauma vortex. And if there was a way to uh, communicate to people that we need to look at the, at the root of it, we need to create strategies for healing of, of trauma in our society, but that, that's like a huge undertaking. I, I think that also there's a lot of misunderstanding that if you get rid of life without parole, it automatically gives people parole. And that isn't true. That they is still true. have to. They still have to go before the parole board, and they have to. Be, and and as we begin to rely more and more on kind of risk assessment, uh, that that people who remain a risk aren't going to be given parole. Exactly. So, but I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about that. That it means that they'll automatically get. They'll automatically be paroled. Right. Right. I know in California, uh, Governor Brown um, issued a lot of commutations for people that left without parole before he left office in 2018. I think it was something like 78 people, really un unprecedented. And um, I know a good number of these people, and a substantial number went to the parole board and were denied the first time, even with the commutation from the governor. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, so, so yeah, yeah, it's yeah, not, but a, it's I, not but a ticket out. It is a misunderstanding, I think, and it's important as we deal with this that we get the real story exactly. out there about what's what exactly. we're even thinking about. And because people are afraid, I mean, your point is really well taken. It's true. People are mm -hmm. afraid, and um, in some circumstances, you know, they they should be. Um, perhaps. Um, 
you know, building in some some additional safeguards as far as the parole process mm -hmm. that would help people to feel, you know, more reassured that the, the you know, the, the, like the criminal justice system is the one that sentenced them in the first place, so we should be able to trust the criminal justice system to decide when they're ready to be released. But maybe some people need additional reassurance as far as mm -hmm. the length of time of parole, the kind of supervision, um, maybe there should be some enhanced services for um, for victim families, um, for you know, for them to be uh, able to process the fact that whoever injured their family is is up for parole. I don't know. I'm just like kind of throwing some of these ideas out. There are a lot of things I think that I could think, be done. Right. I think the other thing is um, one doesn't know if the person has gained insight while in person we went through some programs, went through anything that has gotten them beyond maybe their character flaws that were there when they committed the crime. Well, that the parole board should be able to determine that. I mean, they, but I mean, not all. Oh, but the person doesn't know. The, the, the person who's been injured, you're saying, doesn't know. Right, and other, uh, maybe not all, not, all not, not everything is offered in prison that might have enabled somebody to think differently about themselves. That's true, and, and that's another reason why more programs yeah. need, to, need to be offered. Yeah, absolutely. And it is going to be a case-by-case -case basis. And the person that I'm thinking of, for example, we've asked if they can't have um, an electronic monitoring bracelet on. I, I don't know why we call them bracelets because they're on their ankles. But um, and this is so he he would he would be monitored. He would be at home. With his family, people don't have confidence in that. Oh, I well, I I'm, I'm going to tell you that. Oh, I also am very good on it, but, but. But and that part of that is because of the way we've done it now. Right. But when it was under the sheriff's, yes, they I had agree. the it was under, the victims had. Yeah. It was only done in conjunction with the victims, and, and it was a lot of monitoring. And it was a lot of monitoring, and it was a really well-run program, and people had confidence in it. It just doesn't now because of the way we run it. But anyway, that's a different topic uh -huh. that I feel very passionate about. So, so thank you. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and, and I'm, no doubt I will I will see everybody again because I intend to keep coming back and working with my my collaborators mm -hmm. Tom and, and Skyler, mm -hmm. um, who are my you know we're all a team. Um, without them, I could, I would not be here. Um, so thank you. Good, thank you. Thank you. Are you guys testifying today? Because I would like to ask you, Skylar, how you, as a young student, got. I, I mean, I remember when you came before and yeah. talked to us, but how you got so involved in this topic. Uh, that would be thanks to the guy I'm sitting next to right here in Vermont. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> well. <but laughs> you know, came begging, begging for some work, and I got all that I asked for and, and more. So. Okay. I said I have a project for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. Sentence. <laughs> um, okay. Chelsea. Hi, Chelsea. <laughs> okay. On the topic of. Um, parole, probation. Mm -hmm. um, Charles Manson had life with parole, but he never got out. Yeah. Because every time he'd come for a parole board, there was no way he was going to be able to establish, and the burdens on the person coming before the parole board to give evidence that to convince them that it's safe for them to be released. Right. And so, obviously, he was never able to reach that bar. So I, I, and this is a, a Skyler point, is, you know, um, that we, we should trust the system. If we trust the system to convict people and lock them up for decades, we should trust them to also go through a process and, you know, that, to determine whether it's safe to let them out. And there's a lot of fear on the part of parole boards about making mistakes, and they tend to be mm -hmm. conservative. Sure. And I think that the point that um, Susan was making about um, for the, the idea that we, which we've talked about, of having enhanced services for people that are coming before the parole board with very serious crimes that would give extra resources for assessments and evaluations by psychiatrists, that type of thing. Enhanced re-entry services and enhanced services for the victims' families so that they can be, you know, uh, very much 
part of the process and had access to mental health counseling if they if that would help them through the process and and also the restorative aspects of because of you know Vermont is very committed to restorative processes but there are some programs in other states that are working with really serious crimes um, like we're talking about that have successfully used restorative processes and you know I was part of the um, committee that was looking at using restorative justice for domestic and sexual violence and stalking it's another example of where the victims are not feeling satisfied with the current system and actually often feel better about a restorative process and so you know there's a diversity among victims of what works for them and so we should have a diversity of options for them um, but you know we definitely sh you know we, we all want to be responsible about how things are implemented so I think those those are some of the ways that that might be enhanced we were told that the the um, electronic monitoring system would not be applicable to um, domestic um, situations and our sheriff worked with our state's attorney and the defense down there and in fact it worked really well because the victim knew exactly mm -hmm. what was happening and the, so we make we make assumptions that our, well, assumptions are all, we, we know what that, <laughs> how that spells out, right? But, <laughs> okay. No, I think this is an opportunity to continue to reframe what is truly in the interest of public safety. Um, and, you know, taking violent offenders and locking them up with no, um, you know, impetus to rehabilitate themselves, no opportunity to, is not really truly in the interest of public safety, um, you know, for society outside of prison, but also for the community that's inside of prison as well. Um, and, and we're all going to be better off economically, you know, societally, if we're able to rehabilitate people. Um, and if they're ready to come back in society, great, then we have another contributing member of society. Um, but if not, we have at least, you know, made people inside the prison safer <clears throat> and contributed to not, you know, uh, supporting a practice that is tantamount to torture, as, you know, Susan talked about. Uh, and so I think this, along with other criminal justice reform legislation, is contributing to reforming and uh, reframing that conversation about what is truly in the interest of public safety. If you decided to go into um, either law enforcement or judiciary or law or Still something. Still thinking about it. Okay. And, and Philip, did you have anything you wanted to? I just mention? wanted to say I, I think there's this bizarre schizophrenia where we say we're going to sentence you to life without parole and then we're going to have guards watching to make sure you don't injure yourself and we're going to give you health care to make sure you live as long as possible with the idea that you will never be allowed to leave this facility. That makes sense to me if parole is a possibility, but there's, there's a weird sense yeah. in which we're going to extend your life as much as we can with basically armed guards around you, mm -hmm. and we will never let you out no matter how long you live. Right. If, if you think about it as a rehabilitative process, potentially, for everybody. So everybody has the hope, 30 years out, 40 years out. And then it makes sense, you know, we're, we're preserving your life because we think it has value, and you may one day offer that value to society. Um, but, uh, but we're going to preserve your life. You, right. you might offer that value to society in prison. Well, I, there is that. There, you know, there is that. There's a lot of that actually going can write on. In prison, and yeah. send their works out. Yeah, and I know there's a lot of work in prison. In prison, by prisoners. I, I, I know the prisoners. I know that. I've, I've seen, seen a lot of that. Particularly the elderly, I infirm. It's totally true, but yeah. still, you know, it's I'm still, it's it's still heartbreaking to see oh, yeah. these yeah. people with um, with such potential. You know, in California, they do use restorative justice for even the worst crimes. Mm -hmm. And there's one program that is um, in many of the California prisons. We have 34 prisons. It's called the Inside Prison Project. And they run a year-long uh, weekly program, victim offender education programs. And it helps the prisoners get in touch with, you know, what was the driving force of their crime? What are they going to do with their life now? And um, to develop empathy for their the people they harm, and 
some of the people who uh, took, have taken these courses and now facilitate these courses mm -hmm. are just extraordinary. Mm -hmm. but, oh. but at the end of the day, they go back to a cell, which is six by nine, mm -hmm. that they share with another person. You know, it's heartbreaking. <laughs> That's my, my, my guy. It's, he is doing everything. He's working in the library, and he does all these things, and he mentors people, and he's, he's just a <laughs> wonderful person. Does he have life without parole? No, he does not have life without parole, but given his age and his, everything, it's, um, but, um, and in the meantime, then you're right, he goes back to his cell, and he can have a hug from his wife once a month. That's yeah. our, which is an improvement, <laughs> which is an improvement because <laughs> until until a couple months ago, he couldn't have any hugs from his wife, any physical contact at all. Ever. That's touching on the, the you know tragedy vortex that is this entire situation. Yes. Yes. Uh, you know, his wife is a victim as well. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much.